All right, so welcome um, to the March Grand Rounds. The sun is shining. We have a lot to look forward to and um, we're starting that by switching things around a little bit. So we're at one o'clock our time and um, I, I'm very excited. I'm glad we could work it out um, to have Dr. Dekeas uh, Secolario join us. And this is, as you as we've mentioned earlier, this is an international Grand Rounds. He's joining us from Greece. So we appreciate your time um, presenting to us and sharing us your experiences um, on the topic. Before you get started, I just want to kind of give people a little bit of background about you. You're in the School of Healthcare Sciences at Cardiff University. And um, the way I, I uh, we found your work and we really appreciated your work is um, you have a lot of literature published on this topic area as well as others. So as we're going through Grand Rounds and we're having some really good discussions, I encourage everyone to take a look on Google Scholar and see others. And we can also circulate more of, of Dr. Secolario's uh, work. Um, recent book, Disability Normalcy and the Everyday. And I read some pieces of that. I'm not completely through, but it is a great read. So I encourage everyone to find that on the bookshelves or e-shelves. And with that, I'll turn it over. I, I do uh, appreciate again, everyone joining us for March CED um, Grand Rounds Ability presentation. Dr. Secolario, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight. Well, tonight for me, it's 8 p.m. here in Greece, but this afternoon, um, I mean, I. I really want to thank um, you, Professor Cottrell, for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, to be invited, very excited um, to be presenting here in the, in the Ability Grand Round at uh, West Virginia University. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, I'll just have a brief description of myself and the setting. I am a, a white man in my 40s. I have a black beard and black hair, and behind me it's a white wall on my left hand side you can see a bookcase. Um, and today I will be talking about um, cancer and disability, basically about disparities uh, that people with disabilities face when accessing cancer care, um, not only in the UK, not only in the US, but more generally, but I will be using examples from my own research in the UK mostly, and also data from the US mostly taken from the, the CDC. Uh, database. Um, so I will now share my screen and I hope it's going to work, but I'm sure it will. But, uh, let's see. We see it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so the title of the talk is Cancer Disparities for People with Disabilities, Bridging the Gap. So so this point, I guess, the dual uh, aim of, of my talk. Uh, so the first one is to, to talk, to um, give a provide an overview of cancer disparities faced by people with disabilities. And then I also want to talk about, well, what can we do about it? We know things are not great. We know people with disabilities face uh, many barriers accessing healthcare and specifically cancer care. Um, so we'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about what we can do, things we can do um, to bridge that gap. Um, so just to give you an overview of the, of the objectives of the session and the, the things we will be um, covering. Um, first is an overview of cancer disparities faced by people with disabilities, especially in relation to service access. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking a lot about disparities, for example, in terms of outcomes, disparities in terms of mortality. I, will, I might be touching about, upon those, uh, but mostly it is about disparities uh, regarding service access. Um, we will explore the reasons underpinning those disparities, what's going on, where do they come from, you know, why do we have those disparities? Um, and then the last part of the, of, the, of the talk will be about identifying strategies that could potentially lead to more equitable cancer care. Um, and the presentation overview more or less follows those, um, those objectives. 
So I'll be talking about, you know, the problem, what is the problem, which is the disparities that we know people with disabilities face when they seek to access healthcare and more specifically cancer care. Um, I will be talking about the barriers underpinning those disparities. And then what can we do to make things better? So we know that people with disabilities is not a minority population. For many years, it was a, a commonly held misconception that when we're talking about disability inclusive healthcare, disability inclusive architecture, disability inclusive design, that this only referred to a, a small fraction of the population. That is simply not true. Um, people with disabilities form about roughly 15% of the population, but that really depends on the kind of definition we use uh, for disability and the different classifications. Um, so um, you see on the, on the bottom left side of the slide um, that 26% of adults in, in the US um, have some type of a disability. Um, in the UK, it is about more or less the same 20 to 25%. And that in part may have to do with uh, you know, more refined diagnostic procedures, uh, more rigorous classification, uh, which means that more people get diagnosed, but also obviously with um, longer survival rates, longer uh, life expectancy. And as people, we know that there is a very strong um, correlation between age and disability. So as people live longer, then they're more likely to uh, develop some sort of an impairment that will lead to disability. So, but despite the fact that a substantial part, proportion of the population have a disability, experience a disability, and um, you know, this is only growing, uh, disability is often overlooked, uh, both in health policy and in research on health access. So we often see research where um, we don't see any sort of disaggregation, for example, by disability. Uh, and in fact, we often see research in healthcare and healthcare access where people with disabilities are actively excluded because it would be a confounding factor according to uh, commonly held misconceptions uh, or conceptions in, uh, uh, in research. Which means though, that often their needs, their experiences, the voices of people with disabilities remain invisible. Um, and you see on the, on the right hand side of the slide um, that report co-produced by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK and the World Health Organization, the missing billion. Uh, roughly one billion people with disabilities on there. And they, we don't know much about their needs. We don't know much about the specificity of access to healthcare um, for this population. Um, and in relation to cancer now, we know, for example, that while people with, uh, without a disability in the UK um, may have, sorry, have a very small screen here in front of me, so I need to lean forward to be able to read what that, what's on the screen. Um, so while we know that adults uh, with no disability um, have an age adjusted prevalence of, or, for cancer of 5.2%, uh, People without, with a disability have an age adjusted prevalence of 8.7%. So that it is substantially higher. Um, and yet in most of the research we see about access to cancer services, cancer outcomes, or cancer related research, we hardly see any disaggregation uh, by disability or any specific attention to the needs of, of, of this population. Of course, there are the, the, there are exceptions and there are many uh, the researchers doing that, but it's not mainstream yet. Oops. Um, Nancy Krieger have, has spoken about social disparities in cancer. Um, so defined as health inequities that involve social inequality, inequalities in the prevention, incidence, prevalence, detection, detection and treatment, survival, mortality, and burden of cancer. So in all aspects um, of cancer really. And we see that these social disparities in cancer, they're also there, they also exist. 
for people with disabilities. Um, and later on, as the, as the talk goes on, we're going to examine specific instances, mostly in relation to um, the detection and treatment, um, so access to services, basically, of cancer. But we know uh, there are inequalities in the other, um, in the other areas um, as well. So what is the, the problem? So we know that people with disabilities experience disparities in access to healthcare services in general, not, on, not specifically or not only cancer services. Um, and access to healthcare is a very complex issue because health systems are very complex uh, 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 constructs. Um, and the, the more complex they get, the more uh, complex access to them um, is, and it has many components. Um, so for services to be accessible, they need to be, first of all, available. I mean, they need to be there. We need to have services in order for them to be accessible. There need to be services that respond, uh, that are there. They need to be affordable. Um, and that can mean many different things depending on the, on the nature, the structure, and the financing of the system. But basically, people need to be able to pay for those services without incurring catastrophic uh, health expenditure. They need to be relevant. They need to respond to people's recognized needs. They need to be physically accessible. And, and that refers both to the need um, that people need to be able to go from wherever they reside to a healthcare facility but also within the healthcare facility, though they need to be, um, there needs to be physical accessibility. So for example, we've heard stories, I've heard stories in my research about, um, you know, really well-designed hospitals, healthcare facilities, you know, transportation and all that, but then no accessible toilets. So that doesn't, that means that the healthcare facility is not accessible because it's not only about having wide enough doors, for example, or visual cues or auditory cues for people. They need to cater, they need to respect and acknowledge the needs of people with disabilities. And finally, um, healthcare services need to be acceptable uh, uh, by people with disabilities and by every user really. Um, and that means that people need to be treated with dignity, people need to be treated with respect, people need to be listened uh, to. Now, we know um, that, that um, in the US, uh, that one in three adults with disabilities, and by adults, um, in this case, we mean uh, people between the ages of 18 and 44 years of age. So one in three adults with, dis with a disability do not have a usual healthcare provider. One in three have an unmet healthcare need because of cost in the past year. And one in four did not have a routine checkup in the past year. So you see here in this um, in this diagram, um, which is from um, Levesque, um, a researcher from Canada, um, they outline the the different stages, if you want, and the different components of access to healthcare. And uh, we see on the at the bottom here of the arrow um, healthcare needs and. People both need to be able to perceive the healthcare needs they have, but also there needs to be an approachable service uh, that will allow people to do something about those needs. Um, then people need to have a perception of those needs and the desire for care. Um, they need to be able to seek healthcare, to reach healthcare, to use it. Uh, and we're talking both primary and secondary access. Um, and then we see the healthcare consequences, um, what's happening at the end of the of this process. And all along, you see on the on the top hand side, you see the um, the, oh, system, uh, the system based, if you want values or the system based components. Um, so approachability, acceptability, availability, affordability, appropriateness. And then on the bottom, um, the, here, the other side of the arrow, we see the uh, individual yeah. level factor. We have the CED online staff meeting. Um, 
So we know that there is increasing evidence that people with disabilities face problems in several of these dimensions leading to inequalities in access, where health outcomes reduce the utilization of preventive services compared to the general population. Um, and we know that this intersects uh, uh, with really boring, uh, disabilities face. Um, we know that um, across um, the world, people with disabilities face increased levels of poverty, higher unemployment, and lower literacy and education uh, levels. And also, such structural disadvantage intersects with ableism. So discrimination against people with disabilities um, and the a generalized uh, expectation that all bodies can or ought to conform to an idealized non-disabled norm, which in turn leads to compromised access to healthcare services because equipment, services, um, buildings, uh, attitudes are, are not really geared towards the needs of people with disabilities. Um, if we see here, um, really, um, what I want to show is the problems that um, different parts of the population in the US have accessing um, 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 a medical doctor due to cost. So, um, and this data is from the, um, the Disability and Health Database from the CDC, um, and it's from 2018. So, um, a man without a disability um, had, you know, or if you want, um, there was an 8.4% 8, 8 age adjusted prevalence that um, a man with a, without a disability uh, would not be able to see a doctor because of due to cost uh, in the US. That goes up to 11% um, for a, a woman without a disability. And it's more than doubles for a, a man with a disability up to 24% um, and even higher for a woman with a disability. So you see that first disability is a very important vector here. Uh, so we go from 11% for a woman without a disability to 24% more than double for a man with a disability, but also gender. And we see gender as a vector uh, in both categories, both for people without a disability from 8.4 to 11, and for people with a disability from 24.2 to 26.8 um, um, here. And of, of course, there is geographical variation as well, which, um, which I, I mean, not being entirely familiar with how the healthcare system in the US works and the federal, uh, how its state actually uh, organizes its healthcare. Um, I cannot comment on that, but there is definitely a variation there across um, states. And what is becoming quite clear is that um, states here in this southern plain, or people in this um, in this area, report um, have a higher prevalence of unmet need um, due to cost. And COVID doesn't make things any better. Really, this is a webinar organized by the American Bar Association um, towards the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and there they discuss, we're not gonna watch it now, but I thought I'll post the link here so people can watch it later at their own time. I think it's about one hour long and it's very interesting. It makes for some very interesting, um, if not, not very happy um, viewing. Um, and they discuss the, the issue of rationing of life-saving COVID treatment um, and who gets left behind and the discrimination faced by people with disabilities in the face of COVID. And this has, we have encountered this across the world in the UK where people with disabilities were forced to, um, to give do not resuscitate orders um, and um, or permissions and in other places where people with disabilities were either denied life-saving treatment or they didn't have they were not high up in the priority or they were not seen as a they were basically yes they were not seen as a high priority um, patients um, so this is the if you want the overall um, context but this 
what is interesting to note is that these is encounter or in these inequalities uh, in access to healthcare are encountered across the world in many different in countries with quite different uh, healthcare systems. So, for example, um, in the UK, where we did a study a few years ago, um, there was very similar issues with um, men and women with disabilities uh, reporting increased barriers to access in healthcare and with women with disabilities reporting higher, uh, higher um, level of barriers compared to men with disabilities. And the UK has a, a completely public um, healthcare si system um, entirely free at the point of access. Um, and several similar issues we encountered in Greece as well. Uh, Greece has a more of a hybrid system uh, most people would have access to a, a public healthcare system, uh, which is um, free at the point of access, but they would also use private healthcare on the side um, to um, expedite access, to have better access or better service or for a variety of other reasons. And also in Chile, uh, which has a, a yet a third kind of system it has a, a dual system where people need to choose between public or private healthcare, but they cannot mix and match, they cannot combine, they need to choose one or the other. But across all those three countries, we encountered similar patterns of inequalities, similar patterns telling us that there is something going on. People with disabilities face increased barriers, people with disabilities face increased problems when they seek to access healthcare and they report um, higher unmet needs compared to the general population. Um, now, in, in relation to um, cancer more specifically to, excuse me, disability cancer disparities, we know that people with disabilities are less likely to utilize cancer screening services. And they're more likely to report barriers in access to cancer services compared to people without uh, disabilities. Excuse me. Um, they also report lower satisfaction um, and lower use of services, again, compared to people without um, disabilities. So again, if we see um, data from the disability and health data system from, um, from the CDC, and if we look at the use of mammograms in the past two years um, for women, you see, um, See here the difference between um, women without um, a disability I had 81.1% prevalence of having used the mammogram in the past two years, and with women with a disability that had um, a 74.4% um, prevalence of having used a mammogram in the past two years. Um, and this data is a bit um, date now is a bit older. It's from 2009 from the National Council on Disability. Um, and a report they produced on the current state of healthcare for people with disabilities. Um, but then you'll see here that um, utilizing a pap test was inversely related with uh, severity of impairment, so that women with uh, more complex limit, what they termed more complex limitations, uh, had lower, um, um, lower access, lower utilization of, of pap test compared to women uh, with no disabilities or with less severe or less complex limitations. Um, and similar, similar patterns of disparities are observed globally across different healthcare systems. Um, so there is evidence that people with disabilities experience worse access to cancer screening, not only in the US, but across the world and even in countries with universal health coverage and public free at the point of delivery healthcare like um, like the UK. Um, and there are various studies underlining the existence of disparities in cancer treatment and also substandard experiences of service provision, which then um, which then creates, a, if you want, a bad precedence. And then people who have had a bad experience with, for example, cancer screening, do not want to return uh, for a repeat appointment because they had a very bad experience. Um, this is a, 
a large perspective study from the from England. Um, and again, it shows basically it's more evidence about those disparities in access to screening. Um, it shows that women with disabilities um, in the UK were less likely than other women to participate in breast cancer screening and also in bowel cancer screening. Um, and a study, I will, a study I was involved in also in the UK um, showed very similar uh, results um, that women with a disability or specifically mobility impairment had low roads of having a mammogram than women without mobility impairment. And similar patterns, we see similar um, patterns of issues regarding access to treatment. Um, so screening is one aspect and a very important aspect because it's, it's heavily linked to prevention, which uh, is very important in, in, in cancer. But also we see disparities in terms of access to treatment. So we know that um, women with um, um, uh, as a social security disability benefits and Medicare coverage have lower rates in this study um, of breast conserving surgery than other women. Um, and among women who had breast conserving surgery, women with SSDI and Medicare coverage were less likely than other women to receive radiotherapy and axillary lymph node dissection. And also women with SSDI and Medicare coverage had lower survival rates than those of other women in all cause mortality and also breast cancer specific mortality. Um, and also similar, um, similar results here with lung cancer from this study um, and persons with disabilities have significantly higher cancer specific mortality rate than persons without disabilities. And those persisted after adjusting for demographic um, for demographic and tumor characteristics. So there is something else um, going on there as well. So we know that people with disabilities face barriers, many barriers both that affect both access to screening and access to treatment. Um, but what are these barriers? Well, there are many, they're complex, um, they correspond to those different areas that um, I mentioned earlier on, the different areas of access. Um, and they have to do, for example, with um, inaccessible healthcare facilities and or um, equipment. So healthcare facilities that do not accommodate the needs of people with disabilities and also equipment does, that does not accommodate the needs of people with disabilities. And we're going to see some specific examples um, in a few um, in a few moments. Lack of social support, and often that is very important so, so support that will uh, you know um, help people get from where they live to a healthcare facility, um, for example. Financial constraints, and this have to do with um, well paying for um, healthcare services in systems where payment is required for such services at the point of use, but also paying for medication, um, paying for equipment, paying for care, paying for everything else that, I mean, being, being sick, having cancer is not cheap and having a disability is not cheap either. And those two coming together create, um, as we know from um, existing research, create structural or if you want financial disadvantage um, for people um, and they create costs that are not always recognized. Past negative experiences with healthcare professionals is an important one as well and there is research indicating that um, especially women having a mammogram or a, um, or a pap smear test that due to past negative experiences um, due to um, experiences where, where they felt not, um, they were not respected, they were not listened to, or the procedure was painful, uncomfortable, the equipment was not really, uh, you know, um, could not adjust to their, um, to their needs. They report negative experiences that stops them from returning, stops them from going back, um, 
they think that this is not from them because the system doesn't really doesn't appear to be accommodating um, their needs. And this is tied to discomfort as well. And also inadequate information. Um, there is research indicating that uh, women with disabilities is basically do not receive the information they need about, for example, the need to uh, perform mammograms or to uh, pap smear tests. Um, lack of appropriate, lack of or inappropriate transport is very important as well. Um, I mean, people need to get to a healthcare facility and importantly, they need to get back home as well uh, after their appointment. Um, in a study I, we did in the UK a couple of years ago, there were people saying that, you know, there is hospital, um, hospital uh, transportation to get them to the hospital, that is fine, but then they need to wait around for hours after their appointment because the transit, the transport has specific times that will carry people. So sometimes people might finish their appointment by 10, 11 a.m. and then they need to stick around till 5 or 6 p.m. which is not a very pleasant thing to have to do. Um, and also sometimes it's an impossible thing to have to do. Um, it's basically if people need to go home and rest or uh, conduct other procedures. And finally, but very importantly, what comes through um, is, is inadequate training of healthcare professionals. Healthcare professionals not knowing how to respond, how to address um, to the needs of people with disabilities, to the needs of uh, um, people with disabilities diagnosed with cancer. Um, a group of researchers from Sydney, from Australia, uh, Gwyneth Hulwerklin, and her colleagues, um, they talk about intangible barriers to participation in mammography screening. So they talk about those barriers that you know, have to do with the attitude of healthcare professionals, have to do with how um, the sort of um, interaction that goes on behind closed doors sometimes. So they start by saying that when people enter a healthcare encounter, when people access a service, uh, in this particular instance, um, uh, breast cancer screening services, uh, mammography, they, they have the expectation to be appropriately informed. They have, they have the expectation to be appropriately involved in the, care, in the care they receive, and they have the expectation to be appropriately, uh, to be treated with, uh, with respect. And they say that they found out from their study that their problems, difficulties, inconsistencies across all those three expectations, um, which meant that women were not, were made to feel that this was not for them. They were made to feel that health services or breast cancer screening services were not disability um, inclusive. Um, and behind, you know, statistical figures, um, behind all the, the numbers we have about cancer screening and use, the actual human stories of people who tried to access healthcare, tried to seek healthcare um, because they were, they were worried about new unfamiliar symptoms, um, but then whom the doctors then were reluctant to refer due to diagnostic overshadowing, um, wheelchair users being asked to stand up and healthcare professionals not exploring ways to adapt processes to make them disability inclusive. And that this exemplifies a general lack of disability inclusiveness in the provision of healthcare services, and more specifically, the provision of cancer um, services. And um, just very quickly, I'm gonna show you some examples um, from different sources of information. This is from, the, from this report from the National Council on Disability. Um, the current state of healthcare for people with disabilities. And you see here this quote from a focus group um, that says, in one particularly troubling instance, a provider's value judgment about a patient with mental retardation led to a year long delay in treatment for a life threatening medical condition. The patient suffered from advanced breast cancer that required surgery, but her physician implied that due to her already low quality of life, of life owing to her disability, she did not merit the intervention. 
and her guardian did not want to make the decision to go forward without the physician's support. This woman reportedly died within a year, and there was concern that her death may have been pre precipitated by the delay in surgery. So, I mean, there are many things that are wrong here, but what I want really to highlight is, is this, the, uh, where is it? The already low quality of life. So that, I mean, massive, huge assumption that a person makes on somebody else's uh, life, and also the very significant repercussions this had in this case. Um, this one is a quote from um, a study we did in the UK about um, access to cancer services um, for people with, uh, with disabilities. And you see this quote from um, a guy, Jonathan, um, a pseudonym obviously, uh, who was 50 years old. Um, and I'm gonna read out the quote. And it says, a doctor wanted to check my bladder was okay. So I went off to have a series of tests. And one of them was a test where they filled my bladder with radioactive dye so that it would show up on an X-ray. And then they were then going to watch me empty my bladder to make sure that it emptied properly. And so I went in, there was no changing room for a wheelchair user. So I had to change in the toilet. And then there was no way of getting me onto the table. Um, so if I hadn't been able to transfer there, there was no hoist or anything. I then had dye thrust down my penis into my bladder. And then I was told, right, now stand up and go to the toilet. And it was sort of like, did you not notice that I've just wheeled in in a wheelchair? And it was like, well, we can't do it any other way. And I still haven't had that test. I'm still not near it. So, I mean, this is a particularly, again, shocking example. Um, there was a man using a wheelchair um, and that wheelchair became invisible somehow. Um, he was asked to perform things that he could not. And then he couldn't get the test that he needed um, because of that. And there was no problem solving around that. There was no exploration of other ways to do things or other possibilities there. And then you see this, um, this final one, uh, which I'm not gonna read out, but you know, it's for you to read out if you want, because I'm, I'm aware of the time as well. <laughs> uh, uh, but again, all these instances really, Point to, point to a um, disabilism, to uh, discrimination that people, and ableism, to discrimination that people with disabilities face, to the expectation that their bodies should perform, should operate, should function uh, exactly like everybody else's. And this idea that there is a normative body, a body that must be able, for example, to stand up uh, and empty one's bladder, uh, standing up, uh, the idea that people must be able to climb onto examination uh, tables. Um, um, so this idea that there is a certain kind of body that these services respond to. Um, and you see here that even when people do access services, um, diagnostic overshadowing, so that is the, uh, the, the, mistake, the mistaken attribution of new symptoms to a patient pre-existing disability may delay or completely preclude uh, diagnosis. So um, there are many examples of this, but I've chosen this one from, again, from the, from the National Council on Disability Report from 2009, about a 42 year old woman with paraplegia noticing a lump in her right breast and her medical provider telling her it is a bulging pectoral muscle from pushing the wheelchair. So she was later diagnosed with uh, stage three breast cancer and she died within three years of uh, these delayed diagnosis. So there are many barriers that people face. And last year we did a systematic review looking specifically into the barriers that people with physical disability um, face. And I'm aware that this doesn't capture the complexity of um, all people with disabilities, but it shows the, the, vari the variety, if you want, and the breadth of the different barriers that, um, that people face. And I'm only gonna highlight a few, the ones that have the, you know, the, on the, the column on the far right shows the, uh, the confidence level. So the M is medium and H is high, and then 
L or VL is low or, or, very, lo or very low. So I'm only going to highlight a couple of them. Um, so for example, um, let's see, um, interactions between healthcare providers and women with disabilities, attitudes and behavior, you know, that had a high impact and high negative impact on, uh, on people's access to healthcare. Um, so um, men and women with disabilities reported that healthcare professionals lacking knowledge about disabilities that also had a high confidence um, rating. So that was an important, um, that was an important um, issue. Um, what else? Economic concerns had quite high, um, um, quite high importance. Um, gatekeeping, which is very troubling and worrisome. So not all providers suggesting or recommending referrals for primary healthcare procedures for women with disabilities, including cancer screening. And, you know, and many others that you can see. This has been, the report has been published, so you can look it up and you can um, see the barriers in, um, in detail. So people with disabilities often need to navigate a healthcare system that demonstrates a basic lack of awareness, a fundamental lack of awareness uh, of disability. And it appears to be inadequate, inadequately equipped to meet the needs arising on, arising on the intersections of disability um, and cancer. And I've touched upon some of those issues before, earlier, but the main problems have to do with normativity expectations where people are expected to operate, people's bodies uh, are expected to operate, to function in specific and similar ways, and a widespread lack of disability awareness and or training. Discontinuity of care, which is particularly, at least in the study we did in the UK, was particularly important because people's um, care was medical care or healthcare was fragmented across many different providers who didn't communicate uh, a lot between them, it meant that there was an, a fundamental discontinuity of care and sometimes there were interactions, for example, between treatment taken for um, cancer, a treatment taken for an underlying um, impairment. Individualization of disability and alongside that the responsabilization of people with disabilities whereby disability and the and access to care becomes an individual responsibility. People need to sort it out themselves. It's their body, it's their problem. Um, so that individualization means that the broader structural issues that impede access to healthcare get disregarded. Um, and you see that we can see that across those many of those levels of access to healthcare, um, you know, the they individual or the individual responsibility is only one part, really. The systemic uh, issues here, the systemic factors are very important as well. So what can we do to make things better? How can we bridge those gaps? How can we begin to bridge the gap? Um, so we need a multifaceted, we need a multi-pronged um, approach. First, we need to provide disability inclusive healthcare including cancer services, of course. Secondly, we need to explore um, and to reduce, um, we need to, ex to, to explore the screening underuse and increased cancer incidence. Basically, we need data, we need visibility, we need to know what's happening. And finally, um, education and training of healthcare professionals, so they're disability aware, disability uh, knowledgeable. Um, and I don't know if I'm running over time, but um, I have a, a couple of minutes more just to, um, okay, I see you, Leslie Nodin, so I take that as an okay. <laughs> um, it is important, it is necessary to make all health services disability inclusive. And the worrying thing is that despite extensive legal protections, uh, both in the US with the American with Disabilities Act and in many other countries, in the UK with the Equality Act, across the world with the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, to which um, the US is a signatory, the UK is a signatory. So despite um, those legal protections, people with disabilities still often experience 
de facto multifaceted, de facto discrimination leading to compromised access to healthcare. Um, this needs to change. Um, we know what needs to be done, for example, for services to be accessible, and this needs to happen um, right from the an architectural point of, um, of, of view, but also more broadly in terms of making them affordable, making them available, making them relevant, making them appropriate, making them acceptable. Barriers encountered at each of these levels must be identified and addressed. Oops, sorry. But, um, yes. So secondly, it's visibility. Um, we, we need to know what's happening, basically. We need to have figures. We need to have disaggregated data for people with disabilities. And at the moment, there is an invisibility, or often there is an invisibility of this population in cancer statistics. Um, so for example, the recent extensive information, for example, regarding stage of diagnosis for people with disabilities. We don't know if there is or isn't a substantial difference for, or a significant difference, for example, regarding stage of diagnosis, stage of cancer at the point of diagnosis between people with and people without and disability. Um, I mean, the screening under use suggests there might be, and it suggests that people with disabilities might be diagnosed at a more advanced stage of cancer because of the reduced use of screening, but we don't know. Uh, we don't know for sure. Um, at the very basic, all cancer data should include the Washington Group questions, and the Washington Group questions is a group on disability um, statistics, um, and they have the the short set of only I can't remember five six questions that can provide at the very least some much needed visibility of this population. And then we can look into the interaction between factors such as age, gender, disability, illness, with environmental influences, geographic location, government policies, at the more, at the broader um, uh, ecological level, if you want. And finally, education, it's very important and I know it is lacking because I myself, I teach in a, in a school of healthcare sciences in, in Cardiff, uh, in the UK. And I know that we don't have any disability specific um, courses. I know that there is nothing to specifically prepare people, um, specifically prepare the, the, the medics of tomorrow, the physiotherapists of tomorrow, the occupational therapists of tomorrow to be disability inclusive in their practice to address the needs of people with disabilities in their practice. It is, it is so very important to include people with disabilities in that, to listen and learn from their experiences, uh, to know what is happening, to know basically what will help and what will not, um, and that what will not help. Uh, and, better communication between the various professionals and across the different teams involved in the patient's care is of course very very important and can also help raise awareness on how disability of um, can interact with cancer related um, care and of course we need more access to the environment including screening equipment um, so such as that that used for mammograms and treatment processes such as radiotherapy As the population ages and we have an increasing number of people living with cancer, both with cancer and with disability, it is more imperative than ever that cancer services are disability inclusive. And again, I repeat and I insist that this must happen for all, uh, for all healthcare services. Early and fast diagnosis, equity of access to treatment and care and inclusive health promotion campaigns are key for the development of healthcare services that better respond to the needs of people with disabilities. And we know that improving cancer outcomes is a very complex enterprise, a very complex endeavor. And it cannot be realized without the explicit consideration of people with disabilities and their participation in the decision-making uh, processes. I mean, for one thing, it's illegal to not include, to not be explicitly disability inclusive um, in healthcare services. Uh, on the other, and also that it's impossible to achieve better, better cancer outcomes 
seeing that people with disabilities form a, something, a proportion of fifth, between 15 and 25% of the population, uh, in most, at least in most high income countries, it's impossible to, to achieve better cancer outcomes without explicitly addressing the needs um, of this population. So, so here is my email and my Twitter handle for those of you who want to get in touch. Um, and thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen now. No, thank you for, for a great presentation. I'll open it up for any questions or comments that people have. And then I know that people are, are saying thank you for a great presentation in the chat as well. You're um, welcome. And I'm, I'm sorry if I went slightly over time. Oh, please. No, no, we didn't get you started on time. So you're welcome to that extra. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? about yes grace i see your hand hi um i had a question i know that one other potential barrier for healthcare services um it, that can exist in, exist among lots of different populations is gender identity and gender affirming care i wonder if there are data um about trans or non-binary um, components of access to disability care and i know that this can be especially tricky worldwide where some of that isn't recognized legally, um, but just considering the male, the female, wondering if there are any gaps in there that we should also consider. I think that's a great question. Um, I'll start by saying I'm not aware of any data. Um, I know I did look very, very recently. Actually, I was I was looking into some data about general access to access to general healthcare for uh, non-binary people or trans people and. Um, as, um, as I'm sure you know, um, the statistics, the data doesn't look very good. Uh, people experience uh, discrimination um, for many different reasons. I haven't seen anything specifically about uh, people with disabilities who are identify as non-binary or trans, but I would be very interested to look at that. Um, and, I mean, I imagine that there will be added discrimination and added vector of discrimination there, but I don't know. I, I have no, I, I do not have any data, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's all right, thank you. Thanks, Grace. Any other questions? I do, I do, I do. Find, oh yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, this is a little bit granular. So I'm, I'm wondering, if, of course it's absolutely invaluable to have education campaigns for service workers, doctors, healthcare professionals, across the board, absolutely. But I'm wondering to what extent it was looked at either in any of the studies that you mentioned, or if you know of anybody else looking at what role that public education plays in that. So mm -hmm. education for the public, specifically about cancer and maybe about other um, diseases or illnesses and related to disability. Are there any campaigns and can we break that down to geographical region? So maybe some of the effects that we're seeing happen in combination with all of the, the disparities and what's happening within the healthcare system, but to what extent does public education about public health play in that either nationally, internationally or within regions? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. I think that's a very important, I mean, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's a very important um, point, definitely. I, I haven't looked into that in my, in my studies. Um, I, and I don't know really, but I imagine that it, it would have a very important effect. Um, also because public, we know that often public health initiatives are not disability inclusive. Uh, right. So they portray a certain kind of citizen and a certain kind of service user that is not necessarily always the, I mean, what I remember from a, we did a study in Chile in South America a few years ago, and I remember that a comment that often um, uh, people were saying was that mammograms or uh, pap smear tests were not for women with disabilities. Hmm. So, and I imagine there is lots to do with the public health campaigns there and public policy campaigns, um, you know, and, and also the, that connection that uh, for one hand, between sexual activity and cervical cancer, and also between disability and asexuality, not, you know, not engaging in sexual activity. Right. I mean, both of them 
mistaken uh, assumptions, obviously, both of them misconception, that can have tremendously uh, negative impact on people's and lives. They could be so intertwined too, because people within regions within healthcare they aren't in a vacuum. They live in those communities and they're gonna have some of the same prejudices and biases and misunderstandings that the general population has. Mm. So it's not that it's just healthcare professionals that don't know or don't know better, so. No, it isn't, you're right, it isn't. Because if you, because access to healthcare service has a lot to do with your, the communities that we're all part of. And, you know, and if we see everybody around us doing something, we're more likely to do it as well. Or if we are, if we are recognized as eligible for that service, we're right. more likely to do it as well. Uh, but I, do, I have no data about that, the interaction between the two. And I don't know if it exists. I hope it does, but I'm not sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I do want to add something. I mean, I think our role, you know, we're talking a lot about medical providers, but you know, your presentation, um, and the data point to, it's not just enough for us to refer someone to a service. So if they think they might have cancer, it's not just enough to refer them to um, a hemonc provider in the area. It's actually something that we could do is to uh, make sure that that message gets to that provider that, um, and, and with HIPAA and all of the other stipulations, but that, to, to try to educate them and make sure that that linkage is appropriate. I do know it's interesting with cancer for me because when a person starts, or at least from our cancer partners, when the person starts that journey and then identifies that they have a cancer diagnosis and then starts to treatment, um, so that's assuming that they didn't have a disability going in and then they develop a disability as a result of the treatment or the cancer itself, you wonder if they would still have issues. How do they deal with follow-up PAPs? Mm -hmm. How do they deal with follow-up mammograms or anything like that mm -hmm. now that they mm -hmm. might have a disability, whether they're in a wheelchair, they're, they're mm -hmm. in chairs or whatever the case those that So I wonder longitudinally, mm -hmm. someone who didn't have a disability, mm -hmm. who has one as a result of the cancer, what, what, what would their experiences be with the same providers they started with? Mm -hmm. Right and the yeah. same. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Because the way they access them, because the way they access, the way they enter the system will have changed. Mm -hmm. And the, the way they're looked at from the system or from providers will have changed as well. Right. And the providers, I'm sure, know that the treatment or the cancer effects, mm -hmm. right? They readily, mm -hmm. but, but what you're mm -hmm. talking about is more of the impact on daily living. It's a different level, like you and mm -hmm. Elizabeth. We're, we're talking about a different level of understanding. So. No, but that's very important as well. And I'm sure it happens quite a lot because I mean, I mean, cancer and cancer treatment as well, they can lead to disability, they can lead to impairment. And I mean, it's a common occurrence. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it is more, more common than the published data or the published uh, literature leads us to believe. Mm -hmm. Well, this is really interesting. Thank you. Any any other questions before we let you have your evening back? It's late there. <laughs> any others? Well, you have um, a lot of um, great comments in the chat. Thank you for the great presentation. The examples you provided are heartbreaking, but um, lessons learned there. Opportunities for us to to improve our training and for as a center of disabilities and partners related to that. Uh, there's definitely a lot that we can do there. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. I mean, it was a, it was a, great, uh, was a great evening for me. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it too. We did, we did. have a good night. <laughs> bye bye, thank you very much, goodbye. Thanks everyone.